When people think of the South Seas, they generally mean the South Pacific. The sea between the American continent and Asia constitutes an endless expanse, a seemingly infinite water surface and unspoiled nature. Sunsets like this can only be found here. The South Pacific paints intoxicating colors on the sky, as it were, reflecting an attitude to life that is difficult to resist. The Pacific covers around one-third of the Earth's surface. The furthest distance between the continents amounts to almost 16,000 kilometers. If the puzzle pieces of the Earth's continents were pushed together, the resulting landmass would fit snugly into the Pacific, with room enough for an area the size of Africa, too. Around 20,000 islands are spread over the Pacific. Some islands are so small that merely a few coconut palms grow on them. Others are as large as some European countries. Most people consider the South Seas a paradise, a projection of sun, beach, and, of course, the bikini. It is often forgotten, however, that the word bikini not only describes the fashionable two-piece for ladies, but also a devastating series of nuclear explosions immediately after the Second World War. However, more than 60 years after the first explosion, this has been erased from our minds. Today, bikini is more sex than bomb. The people of bikini still endure the effects of radioactive fallout and the destruction of nature to this day. Some of them feel like human guinea pigs. Others still suffer as a result of radioactive contamination. Even now, thyroid diseases and genetic disorders in newly born children are still an issue. Lemuel Abon lives here and still remembers the explosions to this day. Most of the people on the island, they got sick. And during, maybe after two or three days, something grew on our body, like we had water fell on us. Yeah. Bikini is an atoll in the north of the Marshall Islands. It's located halfway between New Guinea and Hawaii. In the summer of 1946, the USA detonated Abel there. With a capacity of 23,000 tons of TNT, the first bomb of a nuclear test series of experiments had twice the explosive force of the Hiroshima bomb. Abel heralded the beginning of Operation Crossroads. With a series of controlled nuclear explosions, the American armed forces wanted to find out just how atom bombs affect humans and the functionality of materials. Due to Operation Crossroads, the Bikini Atoll and the neighboring islands were contaminated and made uninhabitable for decades. Even today, as environmental restoration measures have continually failed, as Mayor Nishma Yamore explains. We have asked the U.S. government to help clean up Bikini, but the money that was provided to us is not enough to clean up mm -hmm. the islands. Today, more than 60 years after the detonation of the bombs Abel and Baker, the islands can be visited for a short period, enough to see what is left of the American Armed Forces' most ambitious nuclear field research project. We want to see how nature has evolved. We want to find out what is left of the once so fascinating lagoon and its natural beauty spots see the ghost fleet that found a wet grave at the bottom of the lagoon. For this reason, we go in search of clues in the South Pacific, in an atoll that has claimed worldwide fame, or rather notoriety, as the radioactive island. Flashback. It is the year 1946. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki not only ended the Second World War, but also raised questions amongst U.S. military chiefs regarding the impact of the bomb. President Truman releases the funds for Operation Crossroads. Doing so sets enormous logistical machinery in motion. The choice of location for the attempts fell on the Marshall Islands, then on Bikini. The atoll is far enough away from the USA and only sparsely populated. In addition, it is within the reach of a base for B-29 bombers, which are to be used for the drop. Bikini has a lagoon with a diameter of about six miles. 
There, a sufficient number of ships can be anchored as targets, as well as offering enough protection for the supply fleet. Around 40,000 marines and scientists will be deployed during the course of the campaign. 152 planes and 140 supply vessels. Thus, Operation Crossroads is the largest military campaign ever to be carried out in the Pacific beyond the Second World War. In June 1946, under the slogan, For the Good of Mankind and to Prevent Future Wars, a total of 162 people are evacuated from Bikini. The unsuspecting inhabitants wave friendly into the cameras of the reporters whilst leaving the island. They are unaware of the fact that they will never see their home again. While the inhabitants of Bikini leave their home, preparations for the first test run smoothly on the ships and bases of the American forces. Observation posts are occupied and the plane loaded with the first bomb. The commander of the B-29s, Major Woodrow P. Swancutt, names the bomb Dave's Dream after a fallen comrade. Countless photographers, camera teams and radio reporters accompany the day of the drop. The B-29s need about two and a half hours to reach the Bikini Atoll. Then, the drop preparations begin. At 8.59.46 local time, and at a height of 28,000 feet, Abel is released. Shortly afterwards, the biggest inferno in human history is unleashed. It was the first time I've seen the sun rise at the same day. One rose in the east and the other one in the west. And it made me wonder why was that. We just saw the bright light and after what we heard the very loud sound. This is how Lemuel Abon saw it. The now 74-year-old woman was just a child when the bombs destroyed her home. This is how she describes the day. Some of the little children, they were out too, with their mother, who just cleaned outside their houses. And when, when they heard that loud sound, they just hold their mother's trace and cry. And when we heard the very loud sound, we thought that more. Maybe they start, the war start now. There's a, another war. Sixty-two years later, and the inhabitants of Bikini and the neighboring Rongelap are still waiting to be able to return. But that is impossible, as the islands are still radioactively contaminated. A never-ending story. I was hoping in ten years Bikini would be resettled. And now here it is, you know, 20 years later, and, and more than 20 years later, 25 years later, and we're still not resettled. There's been a lot of things that have happened. There's been a very, uh, there's a stricter standard of radiation now that we have to clean bikini to. I hope in my lifetime that we get bikini cleaned and resettled, and I'm 55. From the air, everything looks fine on the Marshall Islands. The Kwajalein Atoll is the largest atoll on Earth. It comprises a total of 97 islands, of which the Kwajalein Island is the most southernmost and largest. Next to Kwajalein is the island of Ibai, the most densely populated. Seen from the air, there's no escaping the magic of the South Pacific. Blue water, white sandy beaches, and barrier reefs. But this initial impression is marred somewhat when approaching the airport. A refinery dumps waste into the turquoise-tinted sea. Then, the airport, we have reached our journey's destination. At first sight, there is no more South Pacific magic, just traffic as heavy as in a big city. The capital, Majuro, has but one street, which leads in a circle around the island. The descendants of those expelled from Bikini live on Kili Island, in miserable huts and on the verge of subsistence. Around 5,000 of them. A few have managed to leave and now live in Canada or the United States. A walk through the settlements of the people on Kili is reminiscent of a slum on the outskirts of Calcutta or Rio. Whoever has electricity or running water is privileged. Corrugated sheet huts and makeshift shacks are the common form of housing in which up to 20 people share one room and sleep in shifts. It is impossible to eat together. They cook outside and those who have an old oil drum 
offer a barbecue on the street. As in most third world countries, the residents of the Marshall Islands lack a real relationship with nature and the environment. Waste is thrown into the sea and washed up later on the beaches. Old fishing boats rust away on the beach. Diesel and oil seeps into the sea as a result. The second man-made environmental disaster takes its course. Plastic, oil and refuse join the food chain, gradually destroy an ecological infrastructure which could normally feed the people of the Marshall Islands. Discarded forklift trucks and boats are simply left by the sea, where they slowly rot. Engine blocks are strewn across the beach. The rusty torsos provide stray dogs with shade. Sometimes the morbid wrecks of modern mobility serve as playgrounds for the children. And there are many of them on the Marshall Islands. On average, each family has 10 children. This explains why, from the 162 evacuated inhabitants of the Bikini Atoll, there are now around 5,000 descendants living here. by dive boat to the Kwajalein Atoll. Approaching from the sea, the magic of the South Pacific immediately begins to cast its spell. In the lagoon is an old levee. Directly next to it, the South Pacific begins. White sandy beaches and a blue ocean as far as the eye can see. Palm trees had a never-ending summer. The dive boat makes its way through the passage in the lagoon. A boatman on the bow gives the captain the directions. The anchor falls in shallow water. And the team makes ready for the first dive into the hand-warm Pacific. About 250 meters offshore, directly beneath the water's surface, is the battle cruiser of the Admiral Hipper class, the Prince Eugen. Almost 1,600 soldiers served on the Prince Eugen when it first took to sea in Germany in 1940. Underwater, the dimensions of the wreck are especially visible at the rear. The former German warship is 212 meters long and 22 meters wide. The propellers are the size of a man. Our group of researchers is hardly noticed. More than 60 years after the sinking of the Prince Eugen, nature has taken possession of the wreck. The hull is covered with corals and mussels, just as the radio mast, with its dense coral vegetation, provides a new home for countless marine animals. After the Bismarck, the Prince Eugen was the largest unit of the German Navy and was the only ship to survive the Second World War and this, relatively undamaged. On the 18th of May, 1941, alongside the Bismarck, the cruiser took part in the legendary sea battle between the British HMS Hood and the HMS Prince of Wales in the Atlantic. HMS Hood was sunk and the Prince of Wales severely damaged. At the end of the war, the Prince Eugen initially came under British command until the drawing of lots saw it awarded to the Americans as war booty. The ship was transferred via the Panama Canal to Honolulu and later to Bikini. Once there, it became one of the target ships of the fleet within the framework of Operation Crossroads. Despite being anchored just one nautical mile from the zero point of the bomb explosion, the ship survived the detonations almost unscathed. The Prince Eugen was towed to Kwajalein for further investigations. But due to the radiation, the stuffing boxes of the drive shafts leaked. Water flowed uncontrollably into the hull of the ship and the Prince Eugen capsized. Around noon of the 22nd of December 1946, the former most modern warship of its time sank to the bottom of the lagoon. When diving around the ship, one is impressed by its sheer size. Even the barrels of the cannons are enormous, which extend into the hazy blue of the lagoon like octopus tentacles. The armor plating of the Prince Eugen can still be seen, especially on the panels of the side walls. The centimeter thick steel plates once provided effective protection against the lethal projectiles of the enemy. 
This grouper has adapted perfectly to his habitat. As befits a military site, he is perfectly camouflaged. He lives in the immediate neighborhood of an octopus. Their relationship is not always harmonious. But just what is perfect down here? We continue our dive, swimming alongside the hull towards the deck. The superstructures of the Prince Eugen struck the lagoon floor while capsizing and have since bent sideways. Towers B, C and D have slid out of their barbettes. Shortly after the ship went down, a recovery was considered, but such deliberations were rejected due to the high radiation levels. In 1973, a re-examination of the wreck took place with the aim of raising it. In the process, damage to the ship's site caused by an explosion of the backboard torpedoes was documented. The divers also noted that further live ammunition and fuel residues were on board the ship. Although no further beta and gamma radiation could be detected, a raising and dismantling of the ship was abandoned due to the high costs and effort involved. When a third examination of the ship took place in 1989, also, with a recovery in mind, the US Navy decided against it because of possible residual radiation in the ship's structural steel. The bow of the ship lies at a depth of 35 meters on the seabed. Like a memorial, it is visible through the misty fog of the lagoon. At this point, the morbid fascination that grips a diver here becomes particularly clear. It's now time for us to say goodbye to the Prince Eugen. Slowly, we re-emerge from the past and into the present but not without bidding one last visual farewell to the former pride of the German Navy. And, to be honest, the Prince Eugen as an artificial reef, overgrown with corals, is a whole lot better than it was as a tool of the absurd national megalomania that led to the Second World War. We continue our journey to Bikini with our diving boat. The atoll is still contaminated by the nuclear bomb explosion more than 60 years ago. The former inhabitants, who are still alive, continue to hope in vain of returning to their home. The grandfather of our dive guide, Edward, used to live on Bikini and refuses to give up hope of returning. This is a clear objective as far as Edward is concerned. When, uh, my future, I like to live here on Bikini and I like to bring the family too. But some kind of situation we face right now is kind of hard for us. But we hope, we uh, hope we're going to come back soon. We reach Bikini. The lagoon is a paradise for wreck divers, and there is good reason for it. Typically, wreck divers are used to, like when they dive in Europe and the UK, they're used to very, very cold water here. It's uh, 84 degrees. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's very warm water. There's no currents. Um, the visibility sometimes is 100, 150 feet, and it's just very, very beautiful. Nevertheless, the thought always remains in the back of one's mind that we are diving in a former nuclear weapon test area. Is it really safe? Jack Needenfall is firmly convinced of this. We have scientific reports that say the fish in the lagoon are not toxic or radioactive. The bikinians themselves eat that, and they're the biggest skeptics in the world when it comes to things on bikini and radiation. So they always go up there and eat the fish. Nothing in the water is a problem. It's all land-based. Um, what grows on the land, if you ate that over a long period of time, would become a problem. So what's in the ocean is not an issue. It's clear to everyone that the dive sites on Bikini are deep. On average, the wrecks are located in depths between 50 and 55 meters. The entry area is at 33 meters. To reach it, unusual deep diving techniques need to be applied, such as decompression on the trapeze or the use of a nitrox mixture. Some feel a little uneasy, as despite their training, only a few have deep diving experience, which they now have to master. The descent begins on the trapeze, and it takes a long time, almost an hour down and more than an hour back up. This takes divers to the limits of endurance Absolute physical fitness is a prerequisite. Our goal is the Saratoga. The aircraft carrier is the flagship of the ghost fleet of 72 ships, 
which were sunk during the course of Operation Crossroads in the Bikini Lagoon. The Saratoga lies straight as a die at a depth of 58 meters. She is the third largest aircraft carrier ever built and for a long time formed the backbone of the US Pacific Fleet. The flight deck is 271 meters long, making her longer than her doomed distant relative, the Titanic. With a water displacement of 33,000 tons, the Saratoga was the world's largest ship when launched in 1927. Everything about this monster ship is incredible. The ship's huge dimensions become clear when considering that the bridge is just 12 meters below the surface, but to reach the flight deck, special depth equipment is a necessity. This reason, and because of the difficult circumstances under which the Saratoga can be reached, the vessel is known as the wreck diver's Mount Everest. When the mighty bow appears through the mostly milky, turbid water, that is the moment that makes all the exertion worthwhile. And this is only the beginning. We are now on the flight deck of the Saratoga. Like driving along a road in fog, it disappears into the milky blue of the deep sea. The underwater floodlights of our camera illuminate the scene. Daylight rarely penetrates at this depth, but our lamps create a mystical, apocalyptic mood in blue. Dense growth on the flight decks of the Saratoga creates the illusion of a reef. Only the honeycomb structure, in which corals and seaweed have settled, indicates that the surface is man-made. The flight deck was made of wooden planks on a steel surface. In the meantime, these planks have rotted away, but the structure of the deck is surprisingly well preserved. While Edward lets himself sink to the seabed, a shoal of trevallies glides across our path. Behind them, when looking upwards along the bow of the Saratoga, we can see the end of the flight deck. The distance between the seabed and the deck is around 20 meters. Down here, it's easy to lose all sense of relations. At the bottom of the lagoon, we find two Grumman F6F Hellcats. 91 of these fighters belong to the strategic weapons of the Saratoga. They were agile and fast and could be quickly relocated. Because of this, they established the air supremacy of the USA in the Pacific region. Characteristic of the Hellcats was the Wright radial pistol engine. A Hamilton propeller provided the propulsion of the spry machine. A total of 12,775 planes of this type were built between the years 1942 and 1945. During the dive, we continually encounter dense vegetation on the walls and convexities of the hull. Nature has taken control of the ship, even at depths of almost 60 meters. The metamorphosis from a war machine to an artificial reef is well underway and doesn't stop at gun carriages and pipes. As the Saratoga was originally planned as a Lexington-class destroyer, the armaments were also planned for a ship of this class. On board, there were eight 20-centimeter anti-aircraft guns on four rotating turrets. These were the heaviest guns ever used on an aircraft carrier. Two were located in front and two behind the centerpiece of the carrier with a bridge and command rooms, the so-called island. The guns were never used, probably because their shock waves would have destroyed the flight deck. Instead, the Saratoga, just prior to its last mission in Bikini, was fitted with eight 5-inch rotating towers with twin mounts. The heavy guns were supported by 14 12.7-centimeter anti-aircraft guns for the air defense. This immense firepower was supplemented with 36 28-millimeter quadruple anti-aircraft guns on nine mounts, also for air defense. Four twin and 12 single machine guns completed the defensive power of the aircraft carrier. The martial firing potential has been replaced by the tranquility of the underwater world. Even in places never expected to serve as a habitat for marine life, corals provide parrotfish with a home, despite the fact that in the immediate vicinity, gun barrels, remnants of the warlike past of the wreck, extend into the blue of the lagoon. But precisely at this point, we can see that the Saratoga was severely damaged by the shock waves of the explosions. In many places, the armor of the ship has been torn apart and once straight structures have been strangely warped. Even the 76 millimeter strong armor of the mounts was damaged and leaned dramatically toward the sky. We encounter a scene of destruction enabling us to visualize what power the shockwaves of Abel and Baker must have unleashed after the detonation. 
the Saratoga has defended herself to the end, survived the initial detonations. But when Baker, second of the bombs detonated underwater, she couldn't withstand the force of 25,000 tons of TNT. We continue to explore the Saratoga. Dark blue ocean, 58 meters down, the wreck appears mystical. Some of the cables are covered with vegetation, resembling oversized lianas from a horror film, creating an almost nightmarish atmosphere. We ascend, slowly, the bridge wing. Here, the last commander, Stanhope C. Ring and his staff once stood, 30 meters up as they anchored the Saratoga in Bikini Bay. Command of the ship then went to Harold W. Lockhart, who left the Saratoga as the last man on the 25th of July, 1946, before the second nuclear test, the so-called Baker Day. Along the port side of the Saratoga, the only way is down. We are searching for an entrance to the interior of the wreck. As if they were bare branches, finger corals stretch toward us when we eventually find our first entrance. Although there is not a flow worth mentioning in the Bikini Lagoon, there are considerable currents in the wreck. We can tell by the swaying of the corals. Algae, no, no boundaries. Not even a wash basin in a workshop. The metamorphosis may take a little longer when confronted with porcelain, but after 60 years, even here, the transition from commodity to habitat is almost complete. We leave the small workshop inside the Saratoga. It seems too dangerous to penetrate further into the ship from here. Passing by a device for dropping depth charges and a torpedo, we swim toward the stern. En route, we encounter impressive corals and even a fire hydrant has mutated into a sculpture after being taken over entirely by corals and algae. It's hard to believe that this was once a heavy gun. Here too, coral growth provides a school of surgeon fish with a new habitat. These Achilles surgeon fish have found a cozy home in the mouth of a 12.7 inch gun barrel. Nevertheless, the threat that a ship of this class once posed is still omnipresent 60 years after the vessel's demise. The dimensions of this central gun turret make the incredible firepower the Saratoga once had tangible. We are still searching for a safer way into the Saratoga. In the process, we work our way along the exterior wall of the aircraft carrier toward the stern. This hatch looks promising, but a glance inside proves to have a sobering effect. Too dangerous. Cables and sharp edges are too much of a risk when in depths of around 50 meters. And we're off again, this time passing by pipes that were cracked and then burst during the nuclear explosions. In the rear section of the flight deck, we have finally found what we were looking for. Here is an entrance to the former plane hangar. It used to be protected by a heavy reinforced door, which is currently nowhere to be found. Judging by the size of the hatch, this entrance could once have been a lift shaft, especially as stairs are also missing. We have reached our destination and now dive into the interior of the Saratoga, past an electrical distributor, which down here leaves us with an uneasy feeling. It's quite scary inside here. The strong lights of the cameras, as well as the diving lamps of the guides and security divers, can hardly penetrate the darkness. The light is reflected by suspended particles. It's a feeling reminiscent of driving a car through heavy sleet. We are in an anteroom of the workshop. Some individual components can be made out in the shadows. As if from nowhere, a large banner fish appears. Majestically, he accompanies us through the sunken workshop. Here too, everything seems to be in good shape. Even cogwheels look quite modern, even though the ravages of time and seawater both taken their toll. The hydraulics for the safety cables on the flight deck used to be controlled with these compressors. What now looks like an antique example of industrial history was in fact state-of-the-art technology some 60 years ago. Some things appear over and over again in the glare of the lamps, things that are difficult to ascertain. Everything has the feel of a ghost town, albeit underwater. Even fire extinguisher pipes resemble pneumatic dispatch systems. The world down here has its own strange perspectives. Coral and plankton have left many bizarre formations behind in the interior of the Saratoga. However, the ground is covered in sediments. 
one careless blow with the dive fin could have fatal consequences. Past the voice pipe, with which the bridge could communicate with the rest of the ship, our journey continues through the interior of the huge wreck. The team is connected with a steel cable. This ensures that no one loses his or her orientation. Objects of everyday life appear in the light of the lamps, only now they look bizarre and difficult to tell what they once were. We leave the workshop and the adjoining rooms and return to open water. Our dive continues across banks of coral in this fascinating subterranean world. We can hardly believe that beneath this underwater landscape, so rich in species, around 40,000 tons of steel remain hidden from view. Now it's time to find the entrance to the aircraft hangar. On our way toward the flight deck, our dive guide Dave shows us once again just how big the guns of the Saratoga are. In doing so, he almost entirely disappears into the mouth of the enormous gun barrel. Then we're off upwards, past corals that sheathe the hull of the Saratoga like a bushy envelope. Leaving the anti-aircraft guns behind us, we pass by parts of the hull covered with fascinating growths and finally reach the flight deck. The bannerfish we saw earlier on is already there. He and his black friend make up our reception committee. A little further and it looks like we've arrived at our destination. There, where the aircraft of the battle group was once drawn up to the flight deck in a huge lift, now a gaping hole, an estimated 50 meters wide, 30 meters long. The edges of this steel crater are erratic. This is why it seems likely that this was the key to the Saratoga's fate. The structure of the ship seems to have been destroyed by the enormous explosion, the death sentence for the aircraft carrier. We dive down to see what awaits us in the depths. In some places, it looks as though the crew have only just left the ship. We're in the anteroom of the hangar. Spare parts like this chassis of an F6F Hellcat lie around everywhere. Surprisingly, we come across less plankton here than in the rest of the ship. There are also fewer suspended particles than we encountered on our way here. Beneath the fallen support, we find the cockpit of a fighter plane. Inside is pure chaos. Everything has been laid waste. The bomb surely cannot have caused this damage. It looks more like it was involved in a crash landing. Right next to the cockpit, Edward finds a Hamilton propeller. One thing is certain, this aircraft wreck is also a Hellcat. Edward urges us to leave. We are behind our time schedule. On our way back, we swim through the former arsenal of the Saratoga. Bombs are stacked in neat rows ready for loading. Each one of these bombs has an explosive force of 2,000 pounds of TNT. Using the fets, they were hung in the discharge chute of the Hellcat. Every plane could carry bombs up to a weight of one ton. Our time in the hangar of the Saratoga is coming to an end. Down here it's easy to forget that we can only be guests for a limited period of time. We swim through the shattered wall of the hangar and experience the sheer size of the ship yet again. We glide almost weightless over the flight deck, as it's time to think about our ascent. For this, the decompression trapeze is used. This is the only way the dive team can ensure a controlled ascent back to the surface. En route, a jellyfish crosses our path. The creature doesn't only kill time for the safety diver, its pulsating movements are mesmerizing and beautiful to behold, even for those of us who've been diving for years. Little by little, the team emerges after our extreme diving adventure. Everything went well, and everyone reaches the surface safe and sound. We mastered the Mount Everest of the wreck divers, 
and enjoyed some very impressive experiences. Now we're hungry for more, and after all, there are another 71 shipwrecks on the seabed of the Bikini Lagoon. We're on Bikini Island. This is where the advanced command post of Operation Crossroads used to be. The bunkers, distributed across the island, once announced and documented the effects of the bombs on the target fleet. Strong steel plates and screens in front of the windows protected the bunker crews, in theory. All the trappings of a paradise island are omnipresent on Bikini Beach. The traces of the nuclear explosion have disappeared. Coconut palms grow profusely, but closer scrutiny reveals the remnants of the island's nuclear past. Even colorful welcoming signs can't detract from this. Military scrap is strewn around everywhere, like this old anchor. The first bunker is in the immediate vicinity of the beach. Nature has reclaimed the island on land too. Bunker is overgrown, the concrete weathered. Inside, there is carelessly discarded scrap. The rotten evidence of a disregard for the island and for nature. These solidified drops of water hang from the ceiling like stalactites. The special environment draws the salt from the damp air and transforms the bunker into a virtual dripstone cave. We continue exploring the island and follow a route inland along an unsurfaced jungle path. This is where the decision will be made as to when or whether Bikini Island can be inhabited again. It's mainly down to cesium-137. It's highly radioactive and was strewn all over the islands by the fallout of the bombs. Cesium-137 is absorbed by the water in the plants. Chemically, it is closely related to the plant nutrient potassium, but rarely present on the calcareous coral atolls. This is why plants absorb cesium as a substitute for potassium and incorporate it efficiently in their fruits. And also why coconuts on bikini have contamination levels of more than 1,000 becquerels per kilogram. In one kilogram of topsoil, 1 to 2,000 becquerels of cesium-137 were measured. The limit is around 370 becquerels. Before people can return, the cesium-137 has to be made biologically ineffective. Well, based on the scientific information that has been provided to us, it'll, I don't think that will happen soon. It'll take, it'll take time, uh, years to clean up uh, Bikini. When following the beaten track, as it were, it's hard to believe that the first nuclear catastrophe since the Second World War took place here. It looks more like the foothills of a tropical rainforest. Another bunker. It is so overgrown that it is easily overlooked. Once again, this is also strewn with refuse. Everything was just left to rot. Even the electrical installations were only provisionally removed. We ask ourselves how the people must have felt who simply waited for the explosion of the bomb protected by the concrete and iron plates in front of their viewing hatches. Were they afraid or did they trust in the omniscience of the military leadership as the Bikinians did? The motto of Operation Crossroads was, if we remember, for God and the prevention of future wars. Anxiety makes itself known when we consider just what has been left over in the years following the tests. The fact that even 60 years after the explosion of the first bomb, remains of Operation Crossroads still rot away is shameful, to say the least. Even though nature has slowly regained the man-made basis of the first peacetime nuclear catastrophe. The rusty chimney peering out of the green of the island like a submarine's periscope is more than just a cautionary reminder, madness and megalomania. We're glad to be back outside again. We take another look at the bunker, which refuses to conform to the rest of the still life with its coconut palm trees. We glance once again at the steel protective flaps in front of the lookout slits and crumbling concrete. Then we leave in the direction of the beach, away from Bikini Island. En route to the beach, we pass by the island's former cemetery. Terrestrially, it is located at the water's edge, thus adhering to the rights of the South Seas. According to their beliefs, 
the deceased travel across the sea to the kingdom of the dead. This is why it is important that the dead are laid to rest overlooking the sea. Journey is short and the deceased don't have to search for long. After the Christianization, the Bikinians combine their traditional beliefs with those of Christianity. Thus, they now bury their dead in solid tombs instead of in hollowed out tree trunks or canoes. For many Bikinians, the loss of their funeral sites is the most dramatic of their fates. They associate the cycle of life with their island and follow the tradition of growing up and living in their homeland, where they should also die. Then it is no wonder that Lemuel Abon still hopes to be able to return to her at all. My, I, I really like to go to Roma, but since they, they didn't clean it yet, I, maybe I'll wait for them. It is said, I really like to go, I will go. We're on our way to yet another highlight of the Bikini Ghost Fleet. At a depth of 50 meters, with its keel uppermost, lies the warship the Americans hated most, the Nagato. For Americans, the vessel is symbolic of the attack on Pearl Harbor at the hands of the Japanese. From this ship on the 2nd of December 1941, Admiral Yamamoto radioed signal 676. Scale Nitaka Mountain 1208. That was an order for Admiral Nagumo's aircraft carrier to attack the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor. The result is history. America was caught with its pants down. The fleet suffered a devastating defeat. This surprise attack later served the American forces as one of the reasons for dropping out of bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After the Japanese capitulation on the 2nd of September 1945, the Nagato was seized by the Americans. After the takeover, the ship was first taken to Enbitok and later to the Bikini Atoll. Once there, she was moored next to the Nebraska, the target point of the bombing for Operation Crossroads. After the Nagato survived Abel relatively unscathed, she was severely damaged during the Baker test. By the 29th of July 1946, the ship had accumulated so much water that it capsized and sank to the seabed upside down. For many Americans, this was a just punishment for the suffering it had dealt America. Nevertheless, valuable lessons could be learned from the sinking of the Nagata for the nuclear strategy of the US armed forces. The fact that the ship sank so slowly led to the conclusion that a heavily armored warship equipped with an efficient leakage defense system should be in a position to survive such a hit. Even though the crew located in the unprotected superstructures and on deck would fall victim to the radiation. Unlike the Saratoga, the Nagato presents a picture of utter destruction. The ship's armor is ruptured. We can see openings everywhere the size of craters, which were eventually to prove the end of the ship. But here too, the abundance of corals and microorganisms inhabiting the wreck is apparent. In actual fact, we had expected to dive into a dead lagoon, but the opposite is the case. There is healthy growth on the Nagato too. Coral trees grow on cannons and masts. The assumption is that the underwater world regenerates faster than the landmass due to the exchange of lagoon water. This theory is confirmed by the fact that the Bikini Lagoon is located within the flow area of the Rongelap Atoll. The world's second largest atoll is 200 kilometers upstream, as it were, and boasts an immense diversity of coral species. It is presumed that this is where the cause of the coral renaissance of Bikini is to be found. Additionally, the corals have developed unique characteristics, meter-long specimens as thick as a man's finger, which entwine the wrecks like trees, can only be found on Bikini. When she entered service in 1920, the Nagato was the most heavily armed ship in the world. The armaments consisted of 170 cannons of different sizes and ranges. Eight of the world's largest guns were installed in the battleship as main guns, with a caliber of 40.7 centimeters. The dimensions of this size become clear when Edward, our dive guide, places his head in the mouth of the huge barrel. The bridge of the Nagato lies on the floor of the lagoon. 
cracked metal and ragged steel braces are proof of the tremendous power that the ship was subjected to while it was sinking. Only a jumble of cables and loosely hanging struts are all that remain of the location from where the order to attack Pearl Harbor was given. Slowly, we climb up, past the four enormous propellers which once gave the Nagato a top speed of 25 knots, 50 kilometers per hour. The size of these propellers can easily compete with those of our modern super tankers or giant container ships. In regard to speed, the Nagato would have nothing to fear from our ocean-going giants either. We have to leave the Nagato now, as our diving time on the floor of the lagoon is also limited. Nevertheless, we still have to go by the Anderson. The destroyer is one of the US warships with the most frontline operations during the Second World War. She took part in all of the great sea battles in the Atlantic and Pacific, predominantly as an escort for aircraft carriers. The 106 meter long and 11 meter wide ship, with a maximum speed of 35 knots, or 65 kilometers per hour, belonged to the fastest in the fleet. She made her name when she saved 340 crew members of the Lexington, a sister ship of the Saratoga, during the battle in the Coral Sea. The Lexington was sunk by Japanese dive bombers. Tragically, the Anderson was in convoy during the Battle of Midway as the second loss of a US aircraft carrier, the USS Yorktown, occurred. She couldn't prevent the loss of the Hornet as a cover ship during the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. This is why she soon had a reputation as a bad luck ship. This reputation and the chain of failures is probably the reason why she became part of the target fleet for Operation Crossroads. After all, the ship was just seven years old at the time she found her watery grave. The Anderson is badly damaged. The hull and the side walls of the superstructures have been torn open by the shockwave. The deck is also in a complete mess. After studying the first pictures made by Navy divers, the military strategists were aware of the fact that lightweight destroyers of the SIMS class are unable to withstand a nuclear strike. This is why the destroyers were replaced by frigates. To this day, these vessels are primarily used by American carrier associations as escort ships. The Anderson has also become a new home for corals and microorganisms. They provide fish with a source of food, as well as protection from larger predators. This makes the wreck an ideal retreat for the new generation of fish that now inhabit the Bikini Atoll. It's time now to move on from the youngest battleship of the Ghost Fleet in the Bikini Lagoon. The Anderson, the bad luck ship of the US Navy, has found her resting place. Contrary to what most naval personnel suspected, she did not take hundreds of crew members into the depths with her. She met her death, so to speak, playing her part in Operation Crossroads, an event which many people today consider to be a much larger catastrophe. The group of the Marshall Islands protrudes only slightly above the surface of the sea. The highest elevation is on the island Likip and clocks up a stately 10.2 meters above sea level. Many of the islands are no higher than just one or two meters. The tidal range, difference between high and low tide on the Marshall Islands, averages at around 4.8 meters. And still, the islands have never been flooded. This could change as due to climate change and the melting of the poles. Coming 100 years, the sea level will rise up to one, possibly two meters. This will result in the Marshall Islands losing around 90% of their surface area to the ocean.
We can already observe how the sea is reclaiming land, little by little, at the cemetery on Inoi. As tradition demands, this too is located directly on the beach. For centuries, the dead were buried here with a sea view, in a mixture of Christianity and the traditions of the old natural religions. Common to both ceremonies is that the graves must be anchored undamaged in the now, in order to provide a place of mourning and remembrance. However, as the cemetery is getting ever closer to the sea, when the tide comes in, some of the older graves are already in the water, and even the newer graves will be totally submerged should the sea level rise by about 50 centimeters. And we're back on the bottom of the Bikini Lagoon again. This time, our destination is the USS Pilotfish, an almost 100 meter long submarine. The Balao class boat lies upright at a depth of 55 meters. It's completely overgrown, but still completely intact. The corals provide glassfish with an ideal habitat. Shoals of yellow-tailed amberjacks also feel at home here, as one has the impression that life down here is especially varied. And here's the tower of the pilot fish. We swim through a protective wall of finger-thick corals. In doing so, we startle a school of glassfish and feel a bit like Sleeping Beauty, only underwater. On the starboard side, a crane can be seen. It was once used to set down the lifeboats or for recovering castaways. Here at the bottom of the lagoon, the scene has a somewhat absurd symbolism. The chutes, which released compressed air when the sub was diving, can be seen very well. They are located at the upper end of the diving tanks, which lend the boat its characteristic shape, similar to that of a whale. In wartime, the pilot fish was used as an escort, sank a freighter carrying supplies for Japan. The sub undertook six enemy missions, but was mainly deployed as a lifeboat after larger ships were hit. It became well known when it participated in Japan's capitulation ceremonies in Tokyo Kaiwan. We come face to face with the ruler of the lagoon, a fabulous specimen. The bull shark is four meters long and the bikinians honor him as a god of the oceans. He keeps bad and inedible fish away from the lagoon, well as protecting the people and ensuring an important balance of nature. In the old natural religion of bikini, the shark ceremony was the most elaborate ritual, during the course of which the shark was regularly offered sacrifices. We continue our dive alongside the hull of the pilot fish, See the pressure tank vents again as we approach the bridge from above. While the hull of the sub seems relatively unscathed, the bridge tower is quite the opposite. The shockwave of the explosion seems to have destroyed everything standing in its way. A bearing compass, overgrown with corals. Nothing much else is left of the heart of the USS pilot fish. This comes as no big surprise, as submarines are only minimally armoured. Their operations are carried out in concealment. When they come out of hiding, the battle is already over. A school of jacks crosses our path. They find plenty of food in the dense coral forest, which is why they can organize themselves in schools. The animals are not at all intimidated by our presence and carry on with their chores as if we were invisible. On our way up, we stop to admire the periscope and the radio antennae of the pilot fish. Yet another spectacular portrayal of the metamorphosis of a warship to a subterranean habitat. One more look and our dive comes to an end. In comparison with other third world countries and the South Seas, the population on the Marshall Islands grows disproportionately fast. This is mainly due to an abundance of children in most families here. For many families, the only possibility of securing an income in old age is to have children, which explains why there are so many. It's quite normal for a family on the Marshall Islands to have anything up to 10 children. This is much higher than the other states in the South Pacific, where the statistical average is four to five children. 
even in the classical developing countries in Africa and in the third world with a high child mortality rate, the average is only around eight children. This leads not only to problems of living space, but also to food shortages. Up to 70 years ago, the people here lived in harmony with nature. The colonial powers that controlled the Marshall Islands from the 18th century until the First World War allowed the islanders to live as they pleased. Everything changed dramatically when the Americans arrived. The American way of life, with all of its attributes, moved in and made the population dependent on the USA. Today, when seen proportionately to the area, there are just as many cars on the islands as in New York. It's hard to believe, but at rush hour on Majuro, nothing moves. To make it worse, there is only one road on the island. Fancy houses and baseball fields were built. The elite celebrate themselves and the people live in huts. The refuse problem has exploded because the islanders simply dump their waste in the countryside or in the sea. They've always done this, but 60 years ago, refuse was biodegradable. Today, plastic and other synthetic materials end up in the food chain and in a few years could trigger an environmental disaster. But the inhabitants of the Marshall Islands have recognized this and are ready for change. Cans, for example, are already being collected and recycled. On our way to our next diving spot, we continually pass by heavenly beaches and picturesque islands in the Bikini Lagoon. Our next dive takes us to the USS Carlisle. The troop carrier, 130 meters long and 18 meters wide, entered service in 1945. The wreck is located at a depth of 50 meters and is severely damaged. The deck is torn apart and in fact, the overall level of devastation is extremely high. This is hardly surprising, as although not part of the plan, the Carlisle took a direct hit when Abel was dropped. The bomb missed its real target by some 650 meters and exploded roughly 50 meters away from another troop carrier, the USS Gillian. The troop carrier capsized as a result of the shock wave within seconds and sank. The Carlisle was anchored in the immediate vicinity of the Gillian, but was blasted over 50 meters away from her original position. Temperatures of more than 50,000 degrees Celsius set the ship alight. Burning Carlisle sank some 40 minutes later. The Carlisle, due to the proximity of the explosion, badly contaminated. Even today, the ground beneath the ship is still highly radioactive and for this reason cannot enter the interior of the wreck. The deviation of the bomb from the planned target turned out to be a major problem. Most of the cameras, especially the high-speed variety, were positioned towards the Nevada and didn't record the explosion. Many of the measuring instruments were exposed to values that either exceeded the measurement range or were below the sensitivity levels. In regard to the Gillian, there were also a large number of measuring instruments intended to gauge the shockwave speed, all of which either sank to the seabed or were destroyed. According to many scientists, the data retrieved from the target ships was unusable and the operation as a scientific test, invalid. Between the US military and the scientists responsible for the test, a fierce debate regarding the responsibility for the failure of the operation ensued and was never resolved. In the meantime, underwater, the Carlisle looks like an oversized reef. No more signs of neutron radiation. Well, at least it's not measurable outside. Here too, we find branch-like corals so characteristic of the Bikini Lagoon. There are countless shoals of fish and one can't help feeling that the fish thankfully accept the metamorphosis of the warship into an underwater reef. This blue shark enjoys the abundance of food here. Majestically, he goes into orbit around the wreck. He thoroughly ignores the diver and disappears into the blue. We begin our ascent at the stern of the Carlisle. Here too, we can see the massive impact the shockwave had on the ship. 
there is hardly anything left intact. The guns have been ripped from their buffets, and the deck is completely destroyed. During our ascent, we become aware of just how strong the power of the detonation must have been. No crew members survived on the Carlisle either. We are still hunting for traces of the Abel and Baker atom bomb tests, and for this, we have to dive down deeper than ever before. We want to pay the Arkansas a visit. She lies in the immediate vicinity of the zero point of the underwater detonation at a depth of 58 meters. The Arkansas is a battleship of the Wyoming class, a ship's classification attributed to the arms race of the European navies and the Americans. Ships like the Arkansas, the Nagato, or later on the Bismarck were all dreadnought warships. Characteristic of these ships were the large calibre gun turrets at the bow and stern, as well as immense firepower obtained through middle-sized and small guns that were distributed along the ship's beam. War reached a new dimension with the arrival of the dreadnoughts. Battles could be fought at great distances. Even here, underwater, the twin barrels of the bow tower still look threatening, despite the fact that in the meantime, they have been taken over by marine organisms. The board weapons on the starboard side also appear ominous, even though we know that they can no longer be fired after such a long time. Their sole presence evokes discomfort. The Arkansas was badly damaged by the Bacon explosion. The vessel was anchored in the immediate vicinity of the transport ships Gilliam and Carlisle, just 155 meters from the targeted area. The shockwave of the underwater explosion ripped the hull of the battleship apart. The Arkansas sank just four minutes after the bomb was detonated. Even after its demise, the Arkansas is still the ship with the most enemy contacts and has served the longest too. The ship has survived two world wars and hardly ever suffered any real damage. Only the tests in line with Operation Crossroads were able to scuttle this floating fortress at the same time initiating a new US Navy strategy by a shift to smaller units. The US armed forces are the biggest employers on the Marshall Islands. The Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Test Site is a missile test station with launching sites on the Kwajalein Atoll. The United States has leased the islands and paid the landowners of the atoll around $8 million in annual leasing fees. After the conquest of the Marshall Islands over the Japanese in 1941, the soldiers exported the American way of life to the South Pacific. But their presence secures an income for the islanders. Many locals work on the base. The Americans take on most of the logistical tasks, such as transport between the atolls and provisions for the population, especially drinking water. It's easy to spot the employees of the military base due to the water canisters they take with them from the base. Even so, the landing craft of the American Navy provide the main means of transportation when it comes to traveling back and forth between the islands. One of the major problems on the Marshall Islands is the population's water supply. Despite the fact that the annual average temperature is 27.8 degrees Celsius, and that with a precipitation of 2,680 millimeters, it rains profusely, water shortages are frequent. There are two reasons for this. On the one hand, most of the islands are unable to form natural water reservoirs due to their limestone structures. And on the other, the islanders' water consumption is on a par with that of Europe's. Another problem is unemployment. But basic care for the islanders is secured by a contract with the USA which has led to a special attitude to life, as Jack Needenthal reports from personal experience. The culture just kind of grew on me. I really enjoyed sitting around, telling stories, going fishing, teaching school. It's a very, very slow routine life on the Outer Islands. And I just really, it's, it was the, the people that became so infectious with me. I just really got to enjoy them and the Outer Island life. I just really like the pace of life here. Children and teens learn to be idle at an early age, 
and just spend their time playing basketball or baseball. Almost all of those who don't have a job on the military base are unemployed. This is true of 40% of adolescents. The inhabitants accept this simply because this is how it's always been. Alison J. Kellen campaigns against this attitude. He was born here, and five years ago, he came up with the idea of resurrecting the islander's traditional means of transport, the canoe. Marshall is mostly all water in a very small, uh, limited land, so it's obvious that the, uh, uh, the canoeing culture, the navigation is very needed. More than anything, he wants to give youngsters a perspective for the future, and he is succeeding. All the kids that we've, uh, we've trained in the past, 80% of them uh, have jobs. Some of them went to school. Some of them went, uh, went back to their home atoll, which is one of the goals. We want the kids to go back to their home atolls and uh, use the skills that they have and uh, provide for the communities in the outer islands and also to, uh, to train others. The canoe project provides young people with the traditional skills of seamanship, the way they have been passed down since time immemorial. It begins with how a canoe is designed and constructed and ends with a first test run in a new canoe. We used uh, the canoe uh, as the medium of the training program. Uh, this actually brings up the, the enthusiast among the kids, so they feel really happy to do it. But uh, we actually uh, teach them how to do basic carpentry, and, um, uh, and then we, they need some kind of math uh, skills, some English, so when they go out, they can actually uh, use the skills uh, to, I always say, to provide uh, for the table or the family. The project is now well established. Many youngsters apply each year, but only a few can actually participate. We get almost 200 kids, and out of the 200 kids, we uh, can only train 25. So I feel like I'm playing God sometimes. The highlight of the work is the first launching of the canoes, which are artistically painted the way old stories describe them. Of course, this arouses a competitive spirit, just as it once was when the fastest canoe was always the first to reach the fishing grounds. Alson trains the youngsters according to this tradition, naturally. Today, it has nothing to do with feeding their families by fishing, but the kids learn playfully much more than they believe. Navigation, crafts, social skills and reliability. Once more, we return to the floor of the Bikini Lagoon. We want to take a look at two further ships that are particularly connected to Operation Crossroads. The first ship is the USS Apagon. The ship is 95 meters long and 8.3 meters wide and could be deployed in depths of up to 120 meters. She lies upright 50 meters below the surface on the lagoon floor. During the Baker test, she was just 800 meters away from the zero point of the explosion. She presumably broke apart immediately after the detonation as the shockwave moved at an incredible speed through the water. Diving alongside the deck, one can see why the Apagon sank immediately after being hit by the force of the underwater detonation. The deck is completely torn apart. The superstructures have been ripped off and even the powertrain in the stern of the submarine is demolished. This direct hit sealed the fate of the Apagon, despite the fact that this class of boat was especially built to withstand underwater explosions. The tangle of cables and twisted metal must have been shocking for the Navy scientists. Everywhere one looks on the ship, there is massive destruction to a degree that even a direct hit by a depth charge couldn't have triggered. The report by the Commission that evaluated the Baker detonation tersely explained, the deployed submarines Apagon, Pilot Fish and Sipjack left just oil spillage and air bubbles behind in the lagoon. A sad realization that also means that no members of the crew would have survived. A shoal of yellowfin jacks complements the still life perfectly. It's quite amazing to see how the biodiversity of the lagoon has developed. From large predators to microorganisms, the food chain is complete. As we ascend, we are treated to a rare sight in the depths of the lagoon. One of the U.S. subs with the most missions in the Second World War lies torn apart in the blue haze of the lagoon.
At a depth of around 53 meters, we approach the USS Lamson. The 104 meter long and 8 meter wide ship is a Mayhem class destroyer, which was put into service in 1934. The Lamson stands upright on the floor of the lagoon and at first sight, in comparison to the Apagon of the Arkansas, looks relatively unscathed. We dive further, and the first thing we see is the main weapon of the Lamson, a rotary turret with a caliber 127 gun. But the surroundings of the turret look anything but unscathed. The deck was probably destroyed by the shockwave. It has been torn wide open in several sections. There is hardly anything left of the superstructures on the starboard side. The Lamson sank within a few hours following the explosion of Abel on the 1st of July 1946. The ship was further away than most ships from the epicenter of the explosion. But in contrast to several of the other ships, she took a full broadside from the shockwave, which severely damaged her. The bridge of the Lamson. Here too, everything seems intact. Even some of the bomb racks are still in place. It seems likely that the Lamson was hit with the multiple force of a so-called freak wave. These waves occur in the aftermath of a tsunami and can be as tall as 40 meters. It's a different story on the starboard side of the destroyer. As far as the eye can see, nothing but destruction. Torn off cables, twisted metal plates, demolished superstructures. One can fully sense the power of the shockwave caused by Abel's detonation. Deck fittings, torn out and thrust through a 70 mm armoured wall as if they were mere toys. Torpedoes protrude from their discharge pipes relatively intact. They appear to be the only ones to have survived the inferno of energy and water. Despite their fate, they are still free of growths. Almost as if they wanted to say, you won't break us. It's definitely more peaceful down here. Once again, we have to admire the regenerative power of nature, which has taken possession of the former flagship and transformed it into an underwater habitat. The metamorphosis is almost complete. The gun barrel almost looks like a grown reef. We end our journey to the ghost fleet on the Bikini Atoll, but not without casting one last look at one of the most impressive images of our diving trip. Whenever a ship's bow appears through the haze of the blue waters of the lagoon, one has that tingling feeling that explorers must have sensed. When one sees a ship's trunk entwined in finger-thick white corals, then we know, for the future, this is on the floor of the Bikini Lagoon, probably the most impressive world heritage of modern times in the South Pacific. But the Marshall Islands are not just Bikini. A seemingly endless number of small islands and atolls far away from the radioactive past are the epitome of the South Pacific. The hermit crabs belong here just as much as the fine white sandy beaches. Hermit crabs can often be seen on the beaches of the Marshall Islands atolls. It's always amusing to watch them running around the beach with their shell houses on their backs. The Arno Atoll lies in the Ratak chain in the southeast of the archipelago, about 18 kilometers east of the Majuro Atoll. If the weather is in a good mood, one can see Majuro from the Arno Atoll. The atoll comprises 103 islands with a land surface of 13 square kilometers. Traveling from Majuro, the atoll can be reached by taking a 40-minute ferry crossing. As the underwater world is in good shape on Arno, one can take a journey into the past of the Marshall Islands 
before the detonation of the atom bombs. Untouched by human hands, one can dive down to intact reefs and observe their inhabitants. Considering the number of schools of fish that we've seen close to the wrecks of the Bikini Lagoon, it seems as though they have their nurseries here. The biodiversity is overwhelming. But this is not the only reason why the marshals are a must-do for ambitious divers. The combination of wreck and reef diving is globally unique. This has also been recognized by UNESCO, prompting them to appoint the site World Heritage Status. Equally unique is the fact that the Bikini Islanders were initially uninspired by UNESCO's plans. As the Bikinians, when we, when we started talking about this World Heritage designation, they didn't want to have the problem of someone telling them what they can do with their atoll. After long negotiations, the Bay of the Ghost Fleet of Bikini became a memorial against the nuclear madness of the post-war years. At the same time, it was deemed that the regeneration of nature should be supported by the World Heritage status. Strict rules were to be complied with. The funny thing was, our restrictions are probably, even before World Heritage came about, we had probably more restrictions on our diving and our tourism operation than most other people in the Pacific. For the people of Bikini, it's a great opportunity to improve their living conditions, as their World Nature Heritage status has placed the Marshall Islands firmly on the world map of tourism. In fact, this is fabulous for Bikini and the Marshalls, not least because of the new jobs created by tourism. Of course, the inhabitants go about their work in typical South Pacific laid-back style, but that's why holidaymakers come to Bikini. Transport is the biggest drawback though, as the airline has closed its doors, making diving areas like this here almost inaccessible. Nonetheless, within a short period, tourism has become an important economic factor, which makes the islanders a little less dependent on money from the US. The Kenyans would take that money every year, all the money would go to them, and typically we'd buy food for our communities on Kili and Egypt uh, as a result of that. Diving in the Arno Atoll is not really what most would expect in the immediate vicinity of Bikini. Here, the nuclear tests were both a curse and a blessing, as the Marshall Islands have not featured on the world map for over 50 years. Tourism has torn the sleeping beauty from her long slumber, but at the same time has instilled those responsible with an awareness of nature and increased their sensitivity for the preservation of their natural resources. And so, even today, one can find still intact coral reefs. Just ask these eagle rays, delicately gliding through an intact underwater world. Equally intact is the food chain within the reef ecosystem, providing fish with a rich food supply, thus enabling them to form schools. Diving reminds us of how the underwater world must have looked long before intensive industrialism and tourism took hold. The world appears to be in fine shape down here, despite the fact that nuclear tests once took place in the immediate neighborhood. It's time to say goodbye to the Marshall Islands, our first trip to the South Seas, but not empty-handed. The people living here have shown us how to overcome even the most difficult of fates, with serenity and inner strength. No matter whether one looks at it from a diver's perspective or that of a nature lover or historian, the ships anchored in the Kwajalein Lagoon constitute a cautionary example of that which Bikini had to suffer, but at the same time emanate a unique fascination. Even today, the American Navy demonstrates its presence on the Marshall Islands. The island group lies within the patrol route of the Pacific Fleet, the Navy closely monitors the area, as strategically, the marshals are located in a position that enables the U.S. to control the entire Pacific. For the benefit of humanity and the prevention of future wars, a unique crime in the history of our planet was committed, with nature as a victim. Whether Bikini really was important in the world peace process remains to be seen. Whatever, the price was far too high. Nevertheless, even here, nature's power is unbroken and has recaptured this habitat piece by piece. And the people of the Marshall Islands have never given up the thought, one day being able to return and once again call the Bikini Atoll their home. This thought gives them hope and leaves us with a multitude of unforgettable and overwhelming impressions of one of our world's most fascinating island paradises, the Marshall Islands and Bikini.